forward button. If, if everybody else is okay with that, because uh, several other people have said they were interested in hearing the talk. Um, so Catherine, take as uh, long or as little time as you like. We were suggesting somewhere between uh, 15 and 20 minutes. And then the, the <clears throat> this is very much intended to be informal, you know, not highly academic, but informal and a chance to explore the topic. Um, so over to you, Catherine. Thank you very much. That's excellent. Right, now I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, I probably need to let you do that. If um, you, yes. Yep, go ahead. Okay, so can everybody see the slides as they look in a slideshow? Yes, excellent. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much for inviting me to take part in the Summer Roadshow put on by this excellent project. And I'm really delighted to start proceedings by talking about the Great Portway, aka the London to Holyhead Road. So the reason I work on this road is that I came across the case in connection with the research that I do on political conflict in early modern Warwickshire, specifically on the feud between the Dudley Earls of Warwick and Leicester and the Catholic gentleman Edward Arden of Park Hall, Lord of the Manor of Curdworth and owner of a really substantial estate in North Warwickshire, which is the basis of a book that I've written with Glyn Parry that came out last year. Um, called Shakespeare Before Shakespeare, Stratford-upon-Avon, Warwickshire and the Elizabethan state. So for full details of how I'm interpreting the case, they're in the book. But right now we're going to concentrate on the road. So as my research progressed, it seemed to me that the crux of the case I'm going to talk about was about control of the road essential as it was to north-south traffic between Wales, the Midlands, the North East and London, and particularly important because of the stone bridge across the Tame, seen here on Ogilby's map of the London to Holyhead Road. And of course, we've now got that browsable on the wonderful new resource that we have. Absolutely fantastic to have. Now, if we look at this triangle here, so I'm using a modern map for this bit, as you can see, um, the Dudleys were very busy in the 1570s acquiring land in this area that would give them control of routes north and south via both Watling Street, so which I'm sure you know we have there, and via the London to Holyhead Road, so approximately here. And we're looking at, a, our issue is just here, just above Water Water. Now this makes strategic sense because you needed to control both if you didn't want a hostile force trying to scoot down one while you were trying to fend the other. So you needed to defend further up. So I think that's what's going on here. And this is my map of the area, which is slightly easier to see with all of the modern roads um, removed. And I think this was also connected with access to Kenawa. Um, which was being used by the Dudleys in the, the 1570s and 80s as an armory. Now, not everybody would say they were using it as an armory, but I'm definitely saying they were using it as an armory as well as a residence. And certainly there was a skirmish at Curdworth Bridge in the early part of the Civil War between forces moving munitions from Tamworth to Kenworth. So it's not an outlandish thesis. So here we can see Curdworth on one side of the road, Dunton on the other, there's the River Thames, there's Coventry, and there's Kenilworth. So that's the political context, okay? Mm -hmm. Right, so now to the road. So it's one of the oldest in Britain, and it's got sections that incorporate Roman roads, um, about which I know very little, it has to be said. Um, and which can still be traced in roads in existence. So here we can see part of a modern map showing the Holyhead Road as it comes out of Coventry. And we also have a description from one of the contemporary documents. So we see here that he notes it's called the portway leading from Litchfield to Coventry. So essentially we're looking at a road of outstanding historical, cultural, economic and geographical significance. And we're also looking at a road that was very well used and very well known. 
So although this divisive dispute was rooted in the politics of the Elizabethan regime, the documents connected to the various legal cases and inquiries give us an extraordinary amount of knowledge and information about the road, including maintenance, traffic, as well as local knowledge, as we can see here in the notes prepared for Edward Arden's adversary in this case, the Warwickshire gentleman, Ralph Rugeley. So, okay. Now, we have here that he notes that Dunton and Cardworth were severed, so divided by a highway called the Portway. Now, in 1578, Ralph Rugeley, who was Arden's neighbour to the east, alleged that a group of Arden's tenants, led by a man called Sebastian Lydiat, had trespassed on land belonging to Rugeley's manor of Dunton and cut down trees growing there. Later documents tell us that a case concerning the land had come before Arden's Manor Court in either 1576 or 1577, and that Sebastian Lydia was foreman of a jury that found for Arden. So Rugeley's case was part of a pre-existing dispute, although both parties agreed that the boundary between the manors of Dunton and Curdworth was the road, as we can see here. And that was not invariant. Everyone agreed the road was the boundary between the two manors. Now, we can also see on this document that it has various details about the road crossed through. And what it actually says here is that we have a highway called the Portway, which fetched not only for carts and wains, but also in brackets, and that most commonly for horses and carriages, which travel out of Lancashire, Shropshire, Staffordshire, and other shires to London. So we know that this was definitely the main route and that everybody recognized that it was the main route. And the crossing through seems to be connected to an attempt by Rugeley not to focus on the wider significance of the road. Well, this was completely hopeless because very soon, the only thing anybody was interested in was the significance of the road. It was impossible to hide the road significance. Mm -hmm. We also have a very interesting use of the word long that I thought we might have a quick look at. It's one of those quirks um, sent to try those of us who use fairly old documents. Because when he's talking about the road, he says, it is very needful that the same be very long. Well, it's like, we know it's a very long road. It goes all the way from London to Holyhead. So what he means in this instance by long is wide. And the width of the road is actually something that is in quite a lot of variance in this dispute. Mm -hmm. So the defence of Lydiate and his fellow accused was that the land where they had cut down the trees was not part of Dunton, but part of the adjacent manor of Curdworth. Now, I'm just going to change the view. There we go. Was part of the manor of Curdworth um, that belonged to Arden and that they had habitually cleared wood on the land. So the essence of the case depended on the route of the road between the two manors. So what we have here is my diagram about the complete competing claims over the road's route. So here we have the manor of Curdworth on the, on the um, west, that's unenclosed. We have the manor of Dunton, hedged and ditched on the east. And in the middle, we have a piece of land. And this is where the trees grew. And Rugeley had claimed that Arden's tenants had cut some trees down and were trespassing here. So Rugeley claimed that the road was this side of the trees next to Curdworth. And Arden claimed that the road was this side next to the manor of Dunton. Also significant were claims about customary activities connected to the central parcel of land that we see here, which became essential to establishing ownership. So what I'm going to look at now are a couple of um, the depositions. Now there are hundreds of depositions Mostly in, star, mostly in Star Chamber documents, but also contained within um, Chancery and other documents. So I've just selected a few. So here we have George Sedgwick, um, husbandman of Curdworth, aged about 38. And he deposes that the villagers of Curdworth had always made and borne the reparations of the portway without any help of any of Dunton. And I think here, this is really worth thinking about what that means in terms of human relationships with the landscape, because we're talking about a really big road here, yet it was still looked after by those who lived along it. 
And I think that's very different from the relationship that we now have with main roads, where we expect them obviously to be maintained by third parties. And we very much focus on moving along them or from one place to another. We have a use relationship with the roads. But for the people living along the London to Holyhead Road at this point, they had a very different, almost person, much more personal relationship. We also have his fellow villager, Nicholas Hawksford, saying that he's not sure how big the piece of land in, is in the middle of the road, but giving us useful information about the width of the land between Dunton and the trees. And this becomes really important. So if we just go back, he says, that it's about nine or, or 10 yards. So he is claiming that the land from the trees to Dunton is about nine or 10 yards, which is big enough for two carts. So this is, this is an issue. He's backed up by his fellow villager, Nicholas Milner, and he says that he goes for 12 yards, so a little bit bigger, but still, you know, not so far away. So he says the space between the trees and Dunton is about 12 yards. And he also agrees that the Queen's Highway, commonly called the Portway, doth lie between the place where the trees group and the tenant trees, which is another name for Dunton. So what we have then are Rugeley's supporters. So we have an example of a deposition here from a man called Simon Meakin, who was brought up at Dunton House. Now, he says that there have been a usual highway during all his memory to pass with horsewain and cart between the said place in question, meaning the trees, and Curdworth Town, leading from Litchfield to Coles Hill. And further, he says that there is not sufficient way for two carts to meet between the place in controversy and Dunton Hedge. Now, his claim is backed up by William Butler of Alton, who was minor gentry. And he also put forward a claim echoed by some of the other deponents who supported Rugeley, who now claimed the road went both sides of the trees, but that the Curdworth side had been made narrower, potentially forcing traffic to use the route next to Dunton Hedge. So it's possible that there was an attempt to either reclaim land or reroute the traffic but this does suppose quite a significant collective action on the part of Edward Arden and his tenants. And it did only emerge after the Assize case. And it did provide a way for Rugeley's defendants to avoid being convicted of lying in court. So I'm quite skeptical about this. But as we can see, what we have are two different groups of supporters making different claims about a road that they all knew extremely well. So what I want to think about now is what we can take away from this case. This is a case that became almost impossible to avoid. The issue of the road became a proxy for the social and political disruption caused by the Elizabethan Reformation in Warwickshire between the mid 1570s and the early 1580s. And Arden was executed in 1583. So that solved the, the issue of the road by bringing Arden's estate into the hands of the crown. And the interesting thing is, is that on the eve of the civil war, when the Arden family got a lot of their estates back, Curdworth was never returned to them potentially to ensure that this issue didn't, rate, didn't um, become an issue again. There were all kinds of court cases. We've got the Manor Court case, the Assize Court case. We've got um, several complaints, more than several complaints in Star Chamber. We've got two Star Chamber commissions. We've got a final commission in 1580 led by Henry Goodyear, who was connected to Burley and Sir Christopher Hatton. So we've also got very national connections. This was not just a local issue which given the status of Arden is hardly surprising. And he brokered a solution in about 1580, 1581, which accepted the land previous belonged to Curdworth, habitually used by the owner of Dunton. So ownership was assigned to Rugeley with access to the land given to both Arden and Rugeley. They were both forbidden from further process. So essentially the final resolution accepts the extensive disruption to local social relationships and also the risk of disruption to a really important transport link. 
So I think the wider things that we can take from this case is that roads mattered. They mattered strategically, socially, and politically. Because in this case, what we've got is topographical knowledge filtered through socio-political allegiance. We can see here that political conflict could change and challenge collective memory of the landscape. And this is problematic because in terms of the court case, a lot of the deponents will not have been able to say what they really knew about the road. And we know how close they were to this road because they've told us about the relationships they have with this road, about the work they do on this road. I think it's also the case that accusations of trespass will often cover for ownership boundary issues. And I think that's really important when we're looking for other kinds of cases like this, because they are quite hard to find unless you sort of stumble across them. But by looking for trespass cases, I think that we might have a, a, a way forward. Um, there are, of course, drawbacks, as I'm sure many of you will already know, of using um, the documents connected to cases like this. They're really time consuming to work with. Um, they're very dense, they're often hard to read, and in this particular case as well, the um, documents are scattered in a lot of different archives, so it's been, you know, it, it's, it's quite time consuming to do. There is a very good chapter by Richard Hoyle um, on a similar case in custom improvement and the landscape in early modern Britain, so we do have models of how we can use these cases to think about um, roads and the wider things that they represent. So I just wanted to finish by saying that there's so much that I don't know about this road. And it might be that some of you do have information that you can share with me. So if you do, I'd be really happy for any information that anybody wants to send me of any kind. I don't know how it functions in the wider network, for example. Um, we have a hamlet of Portway along the Ulster Road. I don't know if that's somehow connected to this portway. I don't know if portway was used as a name for lots of different roads. And this road was the great portway because there were other portways. I don't know if Ogilby then called it the London to Holyhead Road to distinguish it from other ways. I'm not sure which bits of it connect into the Roman road network. So there's lots for us to know. But I think one of the things that I love about this case is that Roads aren't just about transport. They're about politics. They're about social relationships. They're about claims to the landscape. And I think one thing that this case means to me is that roads can tell us so much more than what we actually think we can learn from them. Thank you very much. Catherine, excellent. And uh, I see uh, Stephen has uh, put his hand up. So uh, if I may, uh, and we've got just a question from Justin as well. Let me, many questions. Uh, so let's start with uh, Stephen, who is uh, uh, the co-instigator of VR Regio with myself. Uh, and then we'll come to uh, Justin, and then we'll come to Sarah, and then we'll come to David. Uh, but uh, Catherine, many thanks. And I couldn't imagine a better introduction to this topic. You've You've um, you've bedded road. You've made them very concrete. Uh, I mean, we're talking about a road from 500 years ago, and yes. uh, what you've highlighted is there's a hell of a lot of data out there. A lot yes. of it in court cases. Uh, yes. Some of it which can be gleaned nationally. A lot of it which has to be looked at locally. And certainly, when I finally get round to my own question, I'll be interested yeah. in talking about some of the sources. But in the meantime, let me okay. thank you and hand over to Stephen for his question. Thank you. Uh, it wasn't really a question, it was a clap, actually. <laughs> okay. I pressed a clap, so you okay. got a clap from me, Catherine. Thank you. Um, Do you have a question? Thank you very much, really enjoyed it. Uh, love the uh, references that you gave as well. I'd particularly like uh, to look at some of those, if you wouldn't mind okay. sort of noting them down. Um, Hoyle's uh, chapter, for example. Um, I think I can say something about what a portway is. Okay, um, yes. I think it goes back to the legal definition of, um, <clears throat> of rights of way, which yeah. were, I think, in Edward the First time, set down as being routes between market towns, um, and market towns were otherwise known as port towns. Okay. And even inland, a port was a market. So any road between market towns was 
I believe, a portway. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That's really, and can I just say as well, is that um, I know it's, um, when on these kind of like Zoom meetings and chats, if anybody just has a comment or wants to tell me something, then please do. Sometimes it's so hard to think of questions in these situations. So please, anything that anybody wants to share, I'd love to hear it. But thank you, that's great. I would just say that this idea about a portway being any route between market towns, it's, it's, it's not a generally accepted idea, um, but that sort of speaks to this idea that people don't really know much about no. roads before 1680. Yes, no, uh, they don't. As, as Stephen, you've said to me several times, people basically make the statement, well, the roads weren't very good, were they? And they kind of leave it at that. And uh, yeah. so I, I do feel that everything that we can add to the knowledge of 16th and 17th century uh, roads, both in a very practical, physical sense, and yes. in a broader cultural sense is, uh, is a win. Um, Justin, were you clapping or were you clapping and had a question as well? Uh, well I, I was actually clapping. Um, <laughs> Excellent, well, well deserved. I, I did have a question in mind that I think actually Stephen might have partially answered. Yeah. Um, so the kind of equivalent cases that I've looked at have been from within London in, in the 15th century. So the, the context is quite different, but it always strikes me in those kind of situations that there's so much stress on every time a road is referred to of making it explicit is it a VA regia is it King's Highway yeah. or, or what other status unless I slightly missed it it seemed like Portway was almost being used instead of that sort of status in in some of the instances it was being uh, being mentioned so is there still that that emphasis on its legal status or, or is it does portway become almost a replacement for describing it in terms of its legal status that's really interesting i really really don't know in this in these documents the other thing is as well that, that it is called the queen's highway too so there is an absolute acknowledgement that it is the queen's highway and that's why there's no argument between um arden and rugely about whether it's the boundary they all accept that but you know the issue of naming is really interesting and i don't know anything about it but that's another whole topic in itself the issue of naming and how we came to have all these different names and and, and what is what they signify so yeah. really really interesting topic yeah even quite within london some quite major well what are now quite major roads within the city yes. have maybe three or four different names over the course of one century yes. when you start looking at these kind of documents property deeds and yeah. things and abutments so yeah, yeah. It's, there's huge potential there yeah Definitely. Can you dip in and just um, say it's a good idea to have a look at Catherine Bullen's piece, blog piece on our website about yeah. the origin of the word road. Um, yeah. Because, you know, it, it probably didn't mean a road until around 1650 or so. Okay. Sarah, um, I see we have a, a young member joining us as well on the call. Uh, did you have a question or were you again uh, applauding was, the speaker? I was tapping as well. It was really interesting, Catherine. Thank you. So <laughs> I was really, oh no, the phone's ringing. I was really struck by um, what you were saying about how invested the kind of local communities are in this road, which is, you know, something you expect to find at a really local level, but not necessarily alongside a main road. That was really interesting. Mm. Yes, it is. It is. It's very, um, it's, it's, it's an amazing set of different, of different connections. Yes, right from, and that's the very interesting thing about the court case as well, because the court case, so the way that I've written about it in the book is that the court case is one of those ways of exploring vertical social relationships, because essentially everybody's involved from, from, the kind of from from the poorest villagers in Curdworth and Dunton to people like Lord Burley, who I'm pretty sure um, appoints Henry Goodyear to sort out some kind of solution because this is going on for years and years and years. Um, this is this draws in everybody from every walk of life, and I think that's one of the most interesting things about it. It's really it's it's fascinating how you can explore everything through this one case. 
Catherine, if I may chip in there, um, yeah. you've clearly looked at a very wide range of, uh, of evidence. Um, in some of the legal evidence, do you have evidence from people who were users of the road as opposed to people who were attesting to the maintenance of the road? So do you have people who were uh, driving wains or wagons, etc.? So do you have some sense of the type of traffic uh, that was going down that road and what people were saying about the condition of the road? I do. Sorry, I just had a fly on my screen there. If I start waving my hands, it's not... <laughs> I'm not doing anything. Okay. Um, so basically, yes, nearly all of the nearly all of the deponents are also road users, okay. and a, a lot of them talk about what they did on the road. And mm -hmm. uh, so we have a huge amount of activities that they've done on the road. We've I've got them driving different kinds of livestock. I've got them um, on wheeled vehicles. I've got um, gentry who are using the road on professional business. I've got someone who used to work for the Bishop of Coventry and Lichfield and used the road to travel between Lichfield and London. Mm -hmm. So there's there's loads of information. It's one of those crazy things. I mean, I could have given examples from the definitions for like, you know, hours. But so, so do, you, do you actually have enough data to, even, to do a sort of semi-statistical analysis of the road traffic? Uh, because one of the most trans challenging things in thinking about 16th and 17th century roads, whether they be highways or byways or, mm. or, or minor paths, is it's one thing to identify where the path is or the road is. It's another thing to figure out how, you know, how much traffic actually went down there and, and what sort of traffic is going down there. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's fascinating that in your particular case, you really do have a lot of use cases of, of users of the road of, of that particular point. Yes, it's my understanding. I mean, I could actually, the funny thing is, that's the, why, this is why having these conversations with all of us together are so interesting, because actually, I didn't think about that before. I haven't approached the deposition. Well, I mean, the, 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 first, the first thing to ask yeah. would be, can we separate out how much uh, four-wheel vehicle traffic there is versus yeah. two-wheel uh, vehicle traffic? What the name of the vehicle is? Is it a yeah. cart? Is it a carriage or is it a wagon? I mean, yeah. th this language is very important when it comes to some of the proclamations in both the 16th and 17th century regarding restriction of traffic uh, on the roads. But yes. uh, it sounds like you've got a hell of a lot of data. So I think I think potentially the data is there, but it would require going through a lot of depth. It would uh, uh, require going through a lot of the depositions again. Um, but I think the information is there. But possibly because the court case lasts so because the various court cases because they last so long mm -hmm. i think they would offer a good snapshot but they wouldn't be good enough to offer anything like say weekly or monthly usage sure of course but i do believe that the road was used all of the time well, I, I think that's, if, if I may say so, and I'm sort of speaking for our team yeah. and uh, yeah. just looking at the screen, Joe and Justin and Stephen yeah. and uh, uh, David and James and myself, we're all part of the, uh, yeah. the VRGI volunteer team. I think we'll be very keen to follow up with you on this. We're just beginning to dip into some of the Star Chamber cases. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that there, there might be a lot to, to, to learn from, from that. Yes. Um, I think at the very least, the very least that um, would be, you know, probably quite straightforward to pull together is a list of the different kinds of things that are done on the road, mm -hmm. the different kinds of track, the different kinds of activities, plus the different kinds of vehicles, because even Absolutely. if... Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and, also, and also, I think another thing that would be fascinating would be if you've got any sense of its use uh, in, a, in a seasonal term. I was looking at one of the cases, okay. even as this recently photographed from the Star Chamber, talking about uh, a, a wagoner who yeah. had a very, who very clearly carried different loads in the winter than in the summer because mm. he was traveling through the Sussex Weald, uh, mm. which involved hills. And uh, basically in the winter, it was a hell of a lot harder and you needed more mm. horsepower to get the, the carts up the hills. I'm presuming, but perhaps incorrectly, that this is relatively flat terrain. I don't know what sort of soil type you're talking about. It is quite flat terrain.
terrain. It is, um, I'm not sure about the soil type. It's very, it's quite easy for anybody who lives in, who lives in the Midlands. I used to spend quite a lot of time on Sundays driving up and down, driving up and down what seems to be the road as it is now, uh -huh. looking out the window. And, and the funny thing is that the stone bridge also seems to still be there. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those old stone bridges that's got traffic lights on. So you have to wait on either on either side because now it's too too narrow but it is still yeah. too lame yeah. anyway so i forgot where i was i was i was going with that actually about talking around about driving around on sundays so what what was the we we, we were talking about the what sort of data you had and the potential okay. uh, we had to to maybe quantify some of this anyway let me not dominate this david okay. i think you were clapping david ellis williams you were clapping as well but you may have a question <clears throat> I, I was clapping, but I do have a few comments to offer. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, on the, on, on the 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 use of the term portway, um, mm -hmm. when I was just trying to work out where you were talking about, uh, sorry, in preparation for this lecture, I was before to look at which is area was this, and I looked up the term portway, and I used streetmap.co.uk, which is really good okay. at street names, and there's lots of portways all over the country there are streets mm. called the portway or portway avenue or something and i suspect that it's not a modern name they are being after something older than that so it's it, it, it seems that england has lots of portways the yeah. echoes Stephen was saying about, well possibly roads between market towns um the question i'm interested in is about what exactly was the route between london and holly uh, Something I have a personal interest in uh, recently. Uh, there's um, a unique answer. There are many different routes, um, and there were different at a different time. And I expect even in the 15th, 16th century, like today, people, some people went, some people went. But if you today map and ignore the motor network, previous route from London to Side, which across England is mostly following Mottling Street, which you have. Yes. Um, but that wasn't the way that Taft, when he improved the route in the 19th century, he turned left uh, uh, Weedon Beck and went through um, Aventry, uh, Meriden, Birmingham, and it really joins the road um, north of Shift just before Shrew. Um, yeah. We think is also more or less Ogilvy's route. Uh, yes. So your, your route is deviating from that. You're turning, you're going that way, and you're turning right to go north and rejoin Watling Street, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not suggesting that there is a right answer. People chose to go different ways. I mean, what was regarded as the road? Head. Yeah. Was probably to a very small minority of travellers. Probably most people on the road were not actually going away. They were actually going to Litchfield or somewhere else from onward. David, let's pause it there. You're breaking up slightly on the line. Um, yes. Catherine, your, your comments. Right. So we're talking about the route there uh, because I, I didn't catch all of it, but we're talking about the, the route of why the London to Hollyhead Road deviates from Watling mm. Street. Is that mm. correct? Yes, yes, I, yes. I've, I've thought about that a lot as well. It's really interesting. And um, I believe that the answer is probably quite simple, which is that it has to take in Coventry. But I think that there is also another answer, which is that there are um, some other, there is there are older roads that actually meet in Meriden and potentially they were all established as routes before we know. That's the, sorry, that sounds a bit um, garbled, but actually I think that there's a sort of connection between that goes, that comes off Watling Street across the Midlands through Coventry up past Birmingham on the route that I've been talking about and then rejoins Watling Street and that we don't know a lot about how that connected into the other Midlands roads, but that's that speculation. But that's something that I've thought about a lot as well. 
Thank you. Let, let me uh, throw this open to people who haven't uh, uh, asked questions so far. So um, people I don't know, ever, Helen Shields or Anthea or John Townley, uh, any comments, uh, questions to, to Catherine? I'm willing. <laughs> Hello, Anthea, please go ahead. Oh, yes, I'm unmuted. Um, well, I'm, I'm speculating on two things particularly. Um, one is that in the particular case that uh, Catherine was talking about, I wonder whether the open field system of um, the, the one on the left <laughs> um, is relevant to the, the route of the road in that it would be more easy to uh, invade the territory of the parish because there weren't so many defined hedges and ditches. Mm. And the other question in my mind is that the roads were not at all well defined. Mm. They could wander across the fields, uh, especially if there was a puddle or a tree fallen or something like that, they would take a big deviation. I wonder whether the influence of Roman roads is what might have kept some of them in mm. a more defined route than most roads. Mm. Yes, that's very interesting. The issue as well about Curdworth being unenclosed and Rugeley and, and Dunton being, being enclosed is also, um, and this, well, this, it's silly, isn't it? You have, a, there's just so many things to think about with this. There's so many different things. It's possible that Arden and his tenants were trying to push the root of the road further over towards Dunton Manor so that Cardworth became more defensible because there's another great big geopolitical issue with Arden and his family network. And Arden, his whole estate is in huge swathes of the Forest of Arden. So it's it's possible that they were trying to, um, that they didn't want the road to be as close to Cardworth as it was, that's entirely possible. Um, the other point about where the Roman roads helped to keep some roads on track, as it were, I think I agree with that. I Because my, my feeling with this road is that, especially as it crossed the Midlands, especially from Coventry to Litchfield, this road had a defined route. It did not wander and it was defined and it was two carts wide and it was well-maintained and it was busy. And I think that it was, I think that we can conceive of a road that was really well looked after and very, very functional. You know, I think the idea that all the roads were bad is not true. I think this road was so, I think this road was so important because this road was good. And this was really, otherwise, if it wasn't such a good road, it wouldn't have been so important. I mean, because really this is a national political conflict about this road. So yes, thank you very much. Really interesting points. Um, any other questions? Uh, uh, interesting comments from uh, John Townley into the uh, chat box. I think he's having a sound uh, yes. problem. Um, uh, Helen, any, uh, you're a new face. Any particular questions? No, I'm a bit of an interloper. So I've, uh, I've just started... Is, to, <laughs> interloping just, is good. Just started a one-place study and I there's some various things about the road, but I just don't know where to begin to okay. think. So this has been really helpful in just giving me some ideas. Okay. Thank you. Thank um, you. Stephen, can I, sorry, go ahead, Catherine. Yes. Can I just reply to John, who actually has put um, a question in the chat box? Yes. Um, I haven't looked at references to roads in parish boundary perambulations, mm -hmm. um, I but I have got some very, very interesting surveys, which I was also going to talk about if... Um, you know, if, if they came up and now they sort of had, mm -hmm. have, which is I have got some surveys of various places in Warwickshire, which give all kinds of information about lanes and other roads and back streets and that kind of thing, um, which might supplement the kind of thing that you find. in. And, and you say surveys, are, are, are you talking here quarter session material or are these specific, uh, are these specific uh, surveyors uh, work? These are surveys, so they are surveys done for Ambrose Dudley in the 1570s and 80s, and they are basically, um, they are written, they're not pictorial in any way, which is a shame, but they are extraordinary documents um, because they 
are a written description of not quite every leaf, twig and branch, mm -hmm. but almost. You could recreate the whole of the the places that they're in. There's one for Warwick and there's one for a manor of Rowington. And and does, does, this give you, does this give you a sense of the width of the of the road and whether they're enclosed at particular points? It does. It gives it, it gives an all kinds of information about all kinds of things. But I haven't just reading the surveys is such a labor intensive process that I have only pulled out a few kind of details. But I think that these written surveys are also something that that could supplement all the other material that we have. That, that sounds fascinating. So those are those are manuscript documents which are in the Warwickshire County County Archives or once this is the thing in what you know in warwick the famous kind of like because because there's a lot of sort of like um there's a no, it's not really there's a so in warwick we have in warwickshire we have three record office because we've got the birmingham city archives yes. and we've got warwick record office and we've got the shakespeare birthplace trust so uh -huh. all of the archives are always kind of like in so mm -hmm. the, one of them's in warwick warwickshire record office and the other one's at the shakespeare birthplace trust Fascinating. So both both wonderful places to work, I have to say. You know, it's no hardship, but it and does mean that Warwickshire documents are scattered. Have you had a chance to image those already or not? I have had a chance to image some of them. I'd be happy yes. to share some of the pictures. I mean, so that people could see the kind of um it would probably be better just to share a few um pages to so yes. that people yeah. could see the kind of detail. You, you know, you'd need a month to read the whole thing. Well, if, so, you'd be, if you'd be prepared to sort of uh, email a few representative yes. pages, I'd be very happy to share it to the group of people yeah. on this call. And I, I think I, I can I can say already that Stephen and I would be very keen to follow up with you on this because okay. that sounds a that sounds a good way to get a deep dive into a particular county. We we have yeah. been holding off going into the quarter session material because of COVID, but of course as COVID yeah. um, regulations uh, now change, it's going to be easier. To go into the archives, and yes. uh, we are keen to sort of sample various counties. Stephen, yeah. did you have a question, or um, uh, I just wanted to share this map in case, um, because it's sort of relevant. It's William Smith's 1603 map of Warwickshire, okay. and I've yeah. highlighted in red all the roads, yes. um, including the ones around Curdworth here. Yes, um, there I can see it. Yeah, have you have you yeah. got a copy of that, Catherine? No, I haven't got a copy of that. I'll bung that over because it puts that bit of road in a wider context there. Yes. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any other uh, county maps of, that had roads on them around this area. There's no, none of the neighbouring counties seem to have them. Just Warwick. But it Chicago. actually does show that the, the road network was relatively dense in Warwickshire. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. I am, mean, <laughs> but most of my research is to resituate Warwickshire as like you know the centre of the universe in yeah. the six, in the sixteenth century. So yes, it's it does have it. It it really is a place of transit. It, it's not a place of um. It's a place with a lot of movement and a lot of people moving around all the time. So it's a fascinating county, too. But everybody says that about the county that they work on. So. Well, I think that's probably that's probably a good uh, uh, moment to bring this session to a okay. close. Uh, yeah. Catherine, I think it's been a very stimulating talk. Uh, as you said, you, 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 you've you sort of exposed that the, the roads are both physical and cultural. Uh, you've mm. shown a very wide range of uh, sources. And I think mm. looking at that map at the end and then realising that there are various manuscript sources which would enable mm the VI Regii team, uh, perhaps working with you, to, to mm. dig deeper into some of the uh, issues about roads in Warwickshire mm. in the 16th and 17th century. I think mm. that, that's, um, that's uh, very exciting. So uh, on behalf of everybody else on the call, I'd like to thank you and I uh, hope very much you might stay involved with our project. Uh, thank any, you. any last comments from people? Otherwise, applause. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. much Catherine. Thank you. It's been very, it's, it's been really lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Much appreciated, Catherine. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.